I was distraught on my return from the gig. I had been caught in the rhythm of my own breathing and pacing that the world around me had fallen into a bleak canvas. I could not believe what had happened. I had spent months on the project. There had been days when I would brave the heat in my room. I would sit shirtless with beads of sweat falling from my body. It had all been my sacrifice for this job. There had been even longer nights when I had been powerless against sleep and yet pulled off the miracle of feeble fights to resist her clutches until inspiration found me. Those had been my sacrifices. Those were the things I had to do for my job. I am sorry, Mr. Gasper, the curator had said. A fat man with a face that I desired to squeeze until there was no flicker of life left in him. Your work appears to our critical gaze to be soulless and devoid of shocking compulsion. We cannot accept it for the exhibition. I stumbled forward as though remembering his comments weakened my body. I struck my foot against the pavement that led up to the house. I threw my hands out instinctively as I guarded myself against falling. The pieces rolled from under my arms and fell to the floor. The canvas unfurled and it revealed the image. The curator had to be out of his mind, I wondered. The soul in the painting was as palpable as the breeze that coasted along the hairy outline of my skin. I could see the eyes of my muse with the same remarkable lens that a divine creator's hand could have conjured. I had done everything right. Jason was beautiful from the eyes and an expression. It made my work better because he was oblivious to what I was doing the entire time. I did not speak to him about it because it ruined the effect which I sought. His inattentive poses pulled out a scintillating form in his frame which made for good art. A creator did not need the created to be aware that the created was being formed. It was always important that Jason did not know. I wonder if it was still any use. I had just lost a gig to the biggest art exhibition on the continent, and my heart thumped in agony. I bent over and picked up my art. Perhaps if the curator knew the sacrifice behind the image, he would have been kinder with his words and more lenient with his manners. I rolled the canvas and placed it under my arms and continued to walk into the building. The light above my head flickered when I walked into the passageway, and just then, I heard the door click. I paused in my track. My eyes roamed and I stared backward to plot a reasonable escape with the canvas under my arm. I turned my face the other way quickly, but Jason saw me before I could walk. Gasper, can you speak now? Hey, man, I whimpered and waved at him as I turned around. Uh, you were just coming in, weren't you? He eyes me suspiciously. I could not bring myself to lie to my roommate on such a simple matter. Yeah, I was going to drop something off. I answered blankly, staring at the floor. I can't tell what it is, but these days, man, you've been acting weird, Jason observed. I looked at him and then looked away. I assessed my behavior with nuance behind it, stripped off the black and white coloring lens of which he held it under. I understood my perspective as I respected his. It was the first time we were speaking in weeks. Uh, look, if there's something you need help with, you can always ask. I'm sure we can figure it out, he suggested. His words went into my ears, and I found their way through the canal of my head until they finally settled in my mouth. My lips quivered with the thought. I studied the familiar outline of his face, wondering what I had missed. I had been with Jason since our college days, and we had moved to the new big city together with big dreams. An idea occurred to me. I needed a shocking, compelling painting for my big break. 
just as the fat man had said. Uh, I need you to pose for a painting, I said to him, and pulled him along with me into the open room. Uh, now? Yes, now, I demanded. He stared at me in confusion, but followed me nonetheless. I had one idea, and the rest of my common sense fell into the muddy waters of frenzy. I dumped him into a chair. I marched briskly, searching for tape when I found it. I ran around him and wrapped him with the tape. His confusion did not allow him enough time to resist the tape, and soon it was all around his body, binding him to the chair before he sensed what was wrong. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to be here for a long time, am I? He questioned with an odd look. Uh, I, I have errands to run. Sure, I just need an idea for my painting, I said to him. I had genuinely supposed it would not be so long before I got what I needed. Shocking compulsion, the whole extent of human expression, when it was faced with the sudden shock of electricity. It was a brilliant idea in my mind and it possessed me to the point of insanity. I could not hear the world outside my own mind, and Jason had been bound helpless to his own self. I walked back to him with a bucket of water as rapidly as I could get. It was I who was compelled by an idea so strong that I was sure the curator would accept my painting if I got it right this time. The exhibition was two days away, and it would be excellent for my career if my work were featured. Uh, Gasper, what are you doing? Jason quizzed, desperately heaving, when the full sense of what was happening began to draw on him. I lifted his violently wiggling feet and dumped them into the bucket of water. He tried to knock it over, but his body moved awkwardly. Just a few more minutes and you'll be free, I said rushing into the kitchen to fetch our toaster. I just need to get this right. Get me out of this tape, you fucking psycho! He cursed at me. His face was turning harsh red with a rush of emotions when I plugged in the toaster. You're going to kill me, you idiot! I had a second to think twice about what I was planning to do as I held the plugged-in toaster near the water. I saw the overwhelming misery in his eyes, and it was so powerful and emotional that I knew if I captured even a fraction of his whole expression, I would paint a masterpiece worthy of featuring at the exhibition. I dropped the toaster in, expecting a slight jolt in the water. The horrors of what happened next drew me out of my mind. It was nothing like I wanted to paint. I blanked in dismay as I watched Jason stretch out cold when the full force of the electricity ran through his entire body. I could not bring out the toaster. My mind worked too slowly and by the time it struck me that I had to turn the socket off, Jason was dead. My name is Andrew, and I'm 20 years old. Among other interests, one of the things that really excites me and has become a passion of mine is urban exploring. Cities are like a jungle, and there's a lot of interesting places to discover, many of them hidden and abandoned, completely forgotten by time and by most people. Fortunately, I have a best friend, Artie, who shares this hobby with me. And so once every week, usually during the weekends, we go out and try to get ourselves an adventure in the streets and inside the buildings. It was Thursday in the afternoon and me, Artie, and his sister, Angelica, were having some late lunch at a Chinese restaurant. Hey Andrew, I think I found the perfect place for us to explore tomorrow. An abandoned hospital, which was built in the 1950s. It's located in an area where nobody lives anymore. There's a couple factories nearby, but that's about it, Artie suggested. Now that is a good idea. <laughs> I'm in, I said, already craving for the adrenaline of walking through the halls of a gloomy, old, empty hospital. I want to go too, 
Angelica said unexpectedly. She's actually a few years older than me and Artie. She's cool, and sometimes she hangs out with us, but only occasionally, and never during urban exploring. <laughs> what? <laughs> no way. You're not used to it. Sometimes it can be dangerous. We don't need a third wheel with zero experience, Artie said. <laughs> oh, come on. I just broke up with my boyfriend. I need something fun to do. Please, Angelica insisted. <sighs> okay, fine. Just this time, and only because I know how you're still depressed about breaking up with Miguel, Artie said. Great, you two are the best, but we'll have to go after I finish my shift at work, which is around 11 p.m., Angelica announced. We're going to the hospital at night time? Awesome! Not bad for a first-timer, Angelica, I said. And so it was decided. It was already 2 a.m. when we finally parked our car near the abandoned hospital because Angelica had to finish some extra work and then the three of us had a super late dinner together. I guess we lost track of time. The surroundings were really dark. Public electrical lighting was very scarce in the area. We even heard an owl. Nevertheless, it wouldn't be a problem because all of us brought powerful flashlights. We could listen to every single footstep of ours walking towards the hospital's entrance. The door was, surprisingly, still very solid and locked. But there were other ways to get in. Most windows were broken, and we simply got in through one of those entries. Be careful through broken glass. Don't cut yourself, I said to Angelica. Artie and myself were used to such safety procedures, but she was a newbie. Uh, okay, thanks, Andrew. Whoa, this is spooky, Angelica said, as the three of us were now walking in the hospital's main hall. And she was right. The walls and the floor were extremely dirty, and there was some trash and spray paintings on some places. The rooms were particularly creepy. Some of them still had beds and closets. Whoa, guys, check this out. This closet still has some medicines. Listen to this. February 1972, Angelica said. Whoa, that's actually kind of cool. A true piece of history. I want to take that with me, Artie said. We were now getting used to the hospital and its darkness. More curious than frightened, actually, as we were climbing the stairs to the second floor already. Eventually, one of us was now exploring his and hers different sections, as we felt confident enough to do so. Next thing we heard was Angelica shout from another room. Uh, guys, there's someone down here, or, or something. It's like a shadow. It, it has red eyes. Holy! Then we heard her scream. Immediately, Artie and I ran towards Angelica. When we entered the room, we realized that the floor had cracked and Angelica fell through. L let's go downstairs. Uh, we can enter the room from below, uh, through this door, I said. We did so, and as fast as we could. But when we got there, we were surprised to see that there was no one to see, and Angelica was gone. She's not here. H how's that possible? Angelica! Angelica! Artie started to shout as we searched for her. We searched and searched, not just inside that room, but everywhere in the hospital. It was already morning when we finally called the police and told them what happened. The authorities themselves weren't able to find Angelica. She simply vanished. <laughs> Maybe somebody took her? She was mentioning seeing somebody. Artie said with grief in his eyes and voice. But we didn't take more than a minute to enter that room when she fell. Who could move a person so fast? I replied. I don't know, man, but what I know is my sister's gone. Artie was crushed, and he still had to tell his parents about it. The police were now investigating Angelica's disappearance. As days went by, I kept meeting Artie. He needed a friend more than ever. His parents were devastated with what happened, and they were blaming Artie, and me as well. 
This obviously didn't make us feel better. A part of me felt guilty, but she was the one who wanted to come, and I wasn't going to apologize for wanting to explore abandoned places. We didn't do anything wrong. But, of course, it was easier said than done. In any case, both me and my best friend stopped our urban explorations. A few months later, I got a call from Artie. Andrew! Angelica's back! She came home yesterday. What? Th that's amazing! How is she? Well, um, you... You should come see for yourself. I'm not so sure myself. But the fact is that she's alive and with no physical damage, so that's good. We took her to the hospital, but apparently she's fine. We contacted the police, but see, that's the thing. She's barely speaking. Uh, I could use a friend right now, you know, Artie said. Yeah, dude, uh, I'm on my way, I answered. Once I arrived at Artie's house, I saw Angelica, and I understood what my friend was saying. Angelica didn't speak a word while I was there. Her eyes had an anxious and mad expression. Artie said they were going to take her to a psychiatrist next week. Unfortunately, Angelica had something else planned. I couldn't believe it when I read it on the newspaper later that same week. Young woman murders her own brother and father. Mother in complete shock. That woman was Angelica. She had killed my friend Artie and his father, but she left her mother alive. She was obviously arrested and eventually I visited her in jail, visibly under medication. Angelica was now ready to talk. Angelica, why did you do that? I asked. Because my father and Artie are bad. You are bad. All men are bad. I wish I could kill all of you, she replied. As the investigation proceeded, it was determined that Angelica had suffered surreal, unspeakable things. She was indeed taken by a man that infamous night at the abandoned hospital. But until this day, Angelica refuses to speak in detail about the mysterious attacker and what he actually did to her. Unfortunately, her silence and trauma revealed that it was something too terrible for her to even think about. Regardless of her senseless crimes, I hope she achieves some possible peace. And in time, may the police lead to her aggressor and maybe find some closure. Maybe make the world a safer place. And as for me, urban exploring is over. Forever. Look like an innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Those around us, they are not as they seem. Society forces a face upon people just to keep clear of criticism, hate, discrimination. But seeing it firsthand, it changes you. It all happened within a week. Those closest can become the furthest away. Under a week, is all it takes to see a person for who, or rather, what they truly are. Years ago, back in the summer of 2012, a new neighbor had decided to move in next door to me. It appeared that they had come alone. It looked like a lady, a pretty one too. She seemed to come with very little though. One tiny van dropped off her belongings in her garage, and that was it. She appeared quite mysterious. She would always cover her face when she left the house in the morning. I would notice her black top fly about in the wind, having to stop myself from staring too much as to not seem creepy. Once I returned home from work each day, I would usually notice her in the window of her house, glaring at me from above. The glare felt ominous and rather intimidating, but some strange feeling of intimacy arose from it, so... I became inclined to finally talk to her. Perhaps she was just a bit anxious about meeting new people. This was only Monday. The early morning sky appeared dim. A shroud of moisture consumed the air, 
and combined with my nervous sweating, left me rather uncomfortable. Ignoring my discomfort, I quickly snapped out of my thoughts and made my way down the stairs of my porch to go and talk to the neighbor as she left her house. I was worried that she would take it as harassment of some kind, so I made sure to be cautious when approaching her. Uh, hey there, uh, I'm Ben. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I couldn't help but to notice you. She stopped abruptly. I was rather shocked by the sudden pause and found it odd that she kept her head facing forward as if to hear me out and then continue with her day. Or maybe there was something else. Uh, sorry, um, I didn't mean to stop you. Uh, how are you finding the new ha Quiet! Her voice was shrill and immediately pierced my ears with the wretched sound of severity. After her command, she stood still for a few more moments, as if to let the awkwardness of the situation set in. And once those few moments of pure silence came to an end, she continued walking towards the car, her legs powered with haste to get away from me. I felt entirely bewildered by it all. The woman had let me speak barely a few words and it was already a no. I mean, rejection is normal, but whatever that was, wasn't. Maybe I'll try again tomorrow. This time I would knock on her door and maybe bring her something to give her, and so I could quench my curious thirst to see her face. The next day, Tuesday, was one of the worser incidents of it all. I woke up feeling a raging sense of being watched coursing through me. I got up swiftly to go check the windows and bathroom, but there was nobody there. I was just being silly. At least that's what I thought. I went downstairs to go and retrieve the tray of cookies that I had baked yesterday for the girl. It wasn't much, and my experience with women wasn't the greatest, but cookies seemed right for the situation. It was that or another deathly silence, so I really didn't have a better option. It was around 9 a.m. Outside was dreary and freezing cold. Leaving the house, I felt the sparks of shivers run down my spine, both from the temperature and from my heightened nervousness. I crossed over my lawn onto hers with a slight rush in my movement. The cold wind felt sharp as it smacked against my face while I hurried over to her house. The door suddenly flung open in front of me. I leapt back in fright at the woman standing completely still in the doorway, her head facing the floor, and a horrific silence consumed us both. I thought I would try to act more confident and make us both feel more comfortable, but before I could even speak, she let out a demonic growl and spoke. Leave. Do not come again, or he'll get you. She slammed the door shut, but no footsteps came from the other side. She must still be waiting there, waiting for me to leave. As for myself, I stood, mouth ajar, confused about what the hell just happened. I wanted to give her the cookies, but that voice, there was something darker going on behind that face and curiosity inclined me to discover what it was. Then, Wednesday came, and the sun glimmered across the mist, creating a glistening effect that had engulfed the area. The woman had just left and was walking to her car, but compared to her usual hurried pace, she was far slower today. Each step appeared almost calculated enough so that she could hear anyone else's footsteps approaching nearby. But today, she wouldn't hear nor see any, for it was her house that I wanted to inspect. Eventually, she reached her car. Watching from my porch, I observed as she stood motionless in front of her car, almost as if she hesitated to get in at all, waiting for something to happen. But once she felt that it was safe enough, she grabbed the handle and flung it open. She was now inside and ready to drive off. Fortunately, she didn't hesitate to drive off, and she was out of sight within just a few moments. Now, it was my time. I grabbed my bag and sprinted over to her house. There were a lot of windows, so I started checking to see if maybe the ones next to the front door were locked. 
only to find the door itself to be wide open. How odd. I made my way inside hesitantly, as if expecting something to welcome me on the other side. But through the door, I saw nothing. The house was completely barren, and there wasn't a single bit of furniture lying anywhere, all except for a singular painting which hung up in the middle of the hallway. I walked up slowly to get a better look. It was a picture of a lady with a twisted face. Her mouth appeared to wrap around the sides of her cheeks and her eyes sunk deep into the back of her skull. Her nose rising up and bending with her displaced teeth. The picture was horrific. Why would anyone hang something like this up in the middle of the- What are you doing here? A shrill voice came from behind me. I told you to stay away, or he would find you. With fear striking down my spine, I carefully turned my head to look back towards the woman dressed in black standing behind me, her face still glaring at the ground. If I ever see you roaming this place again, I'll burn your house down with you inside. Now leave. He's almost here. A pounding set of footsteps boomed from upstairs. My blood froze and my body surged with panic. I darted out past the door, running past her and running straight for my house. Looking back, I saw the woman standing there. And then a large pair of hands closed the door in front of her. Whatever was in that house, it was horrifying. I believe the painting that I saw, it, it was actually that woman. Yes, it must have been her face. That's why she always covered it. And the scary thing is, who knows what more he had done to her. But I managed to escape. And since that day, I never dared to look back. For he could still be there, waiting. Waiting to do the same horrific things to me. I woke up with a startled breath. My dog was furious and barking at my phone alarm, screaming at me from across the room. I looked up at the clock and it showed 9 p.m. I shot a quick glance outside. It was dark and bleak. The perfect time for the world to go to sleep. But for me, I was meant to walk Harry, my dog, over two hours ago. The entire time I was asleep entirely unaware of the ear-piercing noise erupting from my phone. Harry must have been barking for however long it took to wake me up, so I grabbed my shoes and his leash, and we made our way outside into the cold abyss of the night. The freezing cold wind slapped me around the face, waking me up from my marginal discomfort from the abrupt awakening. I looked around, and most of the houses in my area had their lights dimmed or shut off, with the few streetlights barely emitting enough light to make the path below visible. I decided it was too difficult to bother walking down a path I couldn't see, and I couldn't use my flashlight in case I woke up the neighbors, so I chose to take my walk elsewhere. Behind my house, there was a small opening in the bushes. I picked up Harry and squeezed my way through to the other side. I was now staring into a row of tall fences projecting out of the floor, with a hole in the middle of them. I looked back towards the opening in the bushes, and hesitantly, I turned back towards the fence and pushed my way through the small opening in the fence panels. I assumed this must be the perimeter fence surrounding the power plant nearby, but the plant was around a mile off in the distance, so walking through the woods here was theoretically safe, I thought. Come on, Harry, we're going on a little adventure to make up for missing our usual walk. Harry barked at me with a whimpered growl following it which I ignored and assumed to be his way of saying he was excited. We trekked on through the mud and damp leaves from the heavy rainfall from the past week until after around 10 minutes, which was when we entered the first clearing. The trees around us appeared monumental in size and towered over us like skyscrapers looming over insects. There had been an odd smell entering my nose since we began the walk, so I guess these massive trees were probably the cause of it. 
but the smell grew faint the deeper we delved. We left the clearing shortly after a quick stop to admire it, and continued our way on throughout the rest of the woods, closer and closer to the power plant. The shroud of time seemed to be devolving as we made our way further into the wilderness. All of a sudden, I felt extremely nervous and my legs began to quiver. The barks of the trees around me seemed to contort and twist into smiles and grins, and the roots below appeared to move and sink into the ground right beneath my feet. I jumped back in fright and Harry barked at the suddenness of my movement. I attempted to calm myself down by telling myself it was just the way the bark looked, until faces began to emerge from them. The bark splintered away as the faces of humans rose out of them, appearing to be wailing in agony. I immediately panicked and grabbed the leash tight and screamed at Harry to run. We swiftly darted our way in the direction we thought would lead us home, but after a full ten minutes of sprinting, we came to no avail of finding the exit. We couldn't even find the fence, let alone the opening in it. Come closer. A raspy whisper shot out from behind me. Harry was first to turn around and bark at the source of the noise. I slowly turned my head to face it. I was utterly mortified. We were in the middle of nowhere, and there was a man emerging from the tree in front of us. What do you want? I bellowed at the damn thing. Harry was still barking. Come closer, it spoke. The pauses between each word had grown, and I felt literal drops of sweat racing down my forehead. That creature then started pacing towards us, still merged with the bark but stretching it out with ease as it came toward us. I grabbed Harry off the floor and raced off in the opposite direction of the creature in the bark. As I ran, I could see the trees begin to twist and turn in all different directions the roots in the ground erupting from the floor, lashing out towards me in a violent temper. I screamed as I made my way through the thick foliage and branches that smacked me around the face over and over, until finally I came into a clearing, only to plummet downwards, smashing my head against the floor as I hit the ground. The world spun and my vision swelled with blood and a blurry sight of red and blue lights flashing far off in the distance. With the vivid sound of voices shouting alongside them, I couldn't hold my consciousness for very long. My head felt as though it was draining, and soon enough, I entered the realm of unconsciousness. Sir, sir, are you awake? The faint sound of a voice suddenly awakened me and I was met with a sharp light beaming into my eyes, with several men dressed in white appearing to be camouflaged against the white walls behind them. My vision soon enough returned to me, and I made out that I was in a hospital room, and the men dressed in white were doctors and nurses. Where am I? What happened? Where is Harry? I went to move from the bed to stand up, but I was pulled straight back down by the metal handcuffs chained around my wrists, restricting my access to leave. Sir, you were brought here in a police car after they found you trespassing in a restricted area. Your dog, if that's who you're referring to, is in the other room. We will bring him in shortly. The handcuffs are in place to calm you, as the effects of the toxic waste you've been inhaling will most likely be there for a good couple more days. Tell me, sir, do you remember seeing anything while in those woods? Hearing the words, I felt a surge of relief pour into my veins. Wait, so uh, all the moving trees, the man coming out of them, and all the faces, they, they weren't real? The doctors looked towards me, their faces stricken with concern. That's true, sir, and unfortunately you did and take a hell of a lot of substance. So those faces you say you've been seeing, well, they're going to be with you for a couple of days. We'll go fetch your dog. And with that, the three of them turned and left the room. There had been no struggle when my heart ceased to feel fear. There had been no tumult, nor the violent waves of panic I anticipated in those weeks when I was so terrified it paralyzed my limbs. 
I had awaited the urgency of that final moment so eagerly, constantly adjusting for impact that I would have felt disappointed if I had the capacity to feel anything at all. Instead, I felt a dull release pervading my numb skin as I stared blankly forward into the eyes of the vermin that sought its own survival. The rat inspired a new desperation in me that took long moments to blossom. All this time I had been afraid, but now I wanted to survive. Both my hands had been tied into each other for so long. I struggled to realize myself from the drawn-out slumber. I could now make out the outline borders of the rope on my skin, borders which had eaten into my supple flesh when the ropes had been tightened around my wrist. Even my pale flesh had become tan with stress and fatigue. I could not care about it, even though the thought of how much thinner I looked troubled my mind. I was seated at the table, as was usual for my evening meals, with both my hands tied forward and visible at all times. My eyes were sore from lack of sleep, and the rest of my limbs ached terribly, but I was awake and fascinated by the gray, parched, wild rat that snuck its way around the table only to see to top it. The pudgy rodent smelt rotten, roiling my stomach, but I had not flinched. I watched it crawl about with a resolute desire for food and keen awareness that it was being watched. Its ears perked and moved about as it crawled over the table. It was at that moment I knew I had lost fear because I had not blinked. The animal rolled over my rope and he gnawed at it desperately, not realizing the futility of what it was doing. I maintained my silence as it did what it had to. Aha, here we go, the perfect cocktail for you. Mrs. Potter, at least who she said she was, returned to the table with a hand grabbing a cup at the base and another clasped over, bearing the weight loss pills. The rat bolted out of sight at once when her voice was heard. I thought it was funny. My aura had become so weak that even quirky praise did not mind trespassing into my presence. My reverie was cut short when Mrs. Potter sat in front of me. It seemed like a lifetime ago since I had first taken those pills. I recalled my first time with such vividness. Every time I held them in my hands and slowed down for a moment's hesitation, before her watchful eyes guided my hands with disciplined duty to my mouth. They were odorless and tasteless. Still, I had the feeling that I already had too much of it in my stomach, and now it had begun to make me sick if I was not numb. I saw in her eyes that she was proud of her work on me. I had been fashioned after the desires of her heart, a perfect merchandise for her own vanity. But it was not that simple. The putrid smell around the house bore the truth of the matter. Mrs. Potter indulged in a trade so despicable that when she had first told me about it after I had been kidnapped, I had not slept for a week. A flesh trader. She had said with as much apathy as one would say that they cleared their lawn for a few bucks. Clients don't need no fucking fatzos, she would say to me. More of a threat than it was a statement. She needed her victims thin. She would say as though it was a simple chore like going for grocery shopping. There were certain people who enjoyed the taste of thin flesh and she was a supplier. Her modest green eyes were all the home I had known for those few weeks. She needed that little time to turn me into a sad form of my past self. There was little I could do to break myself from her overwhelming presence. Mrs. Potter's knife checked every hesitation. I bore the marks of her cuts on my pale skin which witnessed those things, and I would often stare at them with my lifeless eyes. She would often hold her knife, a small dagger with a curved edge under my chin as she spoke. The routine was that I would slip the weight loss pills into my mouth, and if I was good, I got a swig of water to wash it down. If I wasn't, her sharp blade piercing my skin would push me to compliance. On this occasion, I was good, so I got water. Good girl, Mrs. Potter said to me as she handed me the cup of water to wash down the nasty sensation of having too many pills in my mouth. My clients would enjoy you when you're gone. You would be of a better service to humankind after you are dead. 
I thought it was funny that she would say that to me, as though she was powerless herself to bring about a different outcome in events. So I smiled. What's with the humor? She asked, smirking in mild surprise. Do you think <laughs> I'd ever be thin enough? I asked her with a raspy throat. <laughs> she reclined in her seat and blinked at me. When she blinked, she winced, and her brows covered her eyes, layering her appearance with a look of malevolence. My heart beat fast, but I knew what I had to do and I was desperate for it. She punched the table and sighed. My limbs pulsated and I sensed the sweet taste of nail-biting uneasiness filling her mouth. You do need a mirror now, don't you? My weight loss pills have never failed me. Mrs. Potter growled, angrily stirred by her own doubt. When you are thin enough for my clients, I'll do with your flesh as I please, and I would enjoy every bit of it for what you have just done. Can I get water to drink? I said to her, the intensity of my heart racing, turning into an unbearable heat that made it difficult to breathe. Adrenaline and passion fueled my muscles. You would have to drink your piss for teasing me tonight, she said to me and leaned in. I pulled my hands from the table with all of the strength in my limbs, and the rope broke. My heart thanked the animal as I leaped from where I sat with an agility which my slimmer body now offered. I knocked her over and quickly grabbed the cup from the table. I held it by the rim and whacked Mrs. Potter across the face with relentless blows until she could not resist, playing flat out on the floor. That was my moment of escape after weeks of being kidnapped by the evil Mrs. Potter, and I took it. When I fully reconciled what had happened and where I was, I could not feel the lower part of my body. I'd been crumpled up, folded myself at my midsection for what my mind clocked to be half an hour in such a tight space where even oxygen was sore to get. But my mind was not numb. It raced with thought as I struggled to piece the events that had happened over the course of the last hour. An hour ago, I was having the best night of my life. I was on a yacht with the love of my life, and the music was good. I could still feel the aftertaste of that reality of life. Now, I was so far removed from that life. It felt as though I was simply an avatar that had engaged a body in a reality that wasn't mine. I had been filled with so much love and passion for her skin. All the romance which we had promised each other had been fulfilled beyond my expectation. The boat rocked violently. The only thing that remained from what life had been moments ago. I clenched my fingers tightly to control my trembling frame. The heat of my breath palpably filled the space where I was. The stinging stench of sweat filled my nostrils. All the sensations seemed to worsen when I heard the footsteps headed my way. I stared upwards, up against the canopy of the enclosure that hid me in the boat. I mouthed a small prayer as noiselessly as I could when the man's footsteps came over my head and he stopped where I was. I could tell from his grunting and panting that his violence had the intention of malice behind it. It amused me how I was in love, and now I was being loathed at sea in the middle of nowhere. He slashed his weapon against the steel frame of the boat, and the noise slashed against my senses. I shut my eyes to expel the horror. Yes, it filled the frame of my dark lids. The canvas of my mind juggled with memories of the first shot that had rang through the air in the middle of nowhere when I held my lover in my arms. The moment had been so innocent. It was everything we could have wanted. I had taken the boat on a special rental earlier that evening for the sole purpose of fulfilling our fantasy of making love out in the open, far from anybody and any inhibitions that could hold us back. It was the utmost romance and how it had stupefied me that made the terror even more present. I had been vulnerable when we had driven the boat so far away from land and out into the sea. Perspiration from my head beaded around the center of my brows and pooled into one heavy liquid which dropped to top my shirt. My stomach rumbled and I pressed my hand against it to stop the noisy roar. I know you're in there somewhere, Charlie. Come out, he said with a horrible growl. 
A maniacal laughter rent the air, shattering even the grimmest horror which filled my heart and turned to be bloodless. My name's not Charlie. But I knew there was hardly a chance that I would offer myself up to a maniac to reason. I bit my lips in disbelief and in wonder if he had gotten the wrong person. I prayed for Jenny. I had been a coward and I had escaped from her at the first sight of danger. Either way, my night and love had been ruined because of a crazy person whom I did not know. The attacker toured the boat rentlessly, and each step he took made my heart beat faster. He walked this way and that in desperation to find me out from all the compartments of the boat. Did he jump in the sea? He asked. My ears tuned into the conversation. I didn't hear any splashes. Please... Jenny spoke, a plea for the first time since the attacker had climbed into our boat. My heart ached after her speech, and I felt the sharp pangs of my muscles spasming around my chest. The clear and present danger we had found ourselves in made no sense. I had reasoned through all the enemies I'd made, and none of them had enough notice to come after me in my most intimate moment in the middle of nowhere to find me out alone and armed with a machete and a gun. The gun scared me for its own reason, as did the machete. My mind worked up the images of dreadful things. It struck me that I never thought of what happened to a body when death closed in. It was an overload of sensations, available and absent at the same time. I could feel the tears which glazed my eyes, burning in them. I could not save Jenny, and I could not save myself. The helplessness heightened how I felt. I was aware of the contracting corridor where I had hidden myself. I was aware of the heat that came from it. The tingling pulse that made its way right under my skin returned. My ears whirred. I was aware of the heat and the sweat of my skin in the enclosed spaces. I was deep in my fear, and nothing mattered in that moment. Well, I guess this is it, Jenny. The attacker called her name. I froze all over. I was certain now that if he caught on to me, I was dead. He wanted us dead. The scent rallied through the air, mixed with the acrid smell of the sea, and it turned in my stomach until I could not hold it down any longer. I jerked as I puked a hot batch of my irritated stomach. I stifled it as much as I could, causing a stain on my body. You cheat on me when all I've done is love you, he said, and I heard a gun drawn in the distance. I folded deeply into myself. Please, Martin, please, she cried and begged, but it was too late. Martin, as I found out his name, had his mind made up. He shot his gun, I assumed at her, and her pleading stopped with the violence of his shot. I covered my mouth with my hands, pressed over each other, and maintained my silence. My instinct and desperation to survive kicked in, even though I struggled to maintain my cool. Jenny was dead. Another shot rang out, tearing the air. It was more than I could take. I untucked myself from the corner of the boat where I had hidden, and I'd made up my mind to make a blind run for it. I picked my pace and dashed as fast as I could muster the strength to run. My feet failed me when they had been deprived of blood circulation for too long. The electric charge buzzed through the lower parts of my body and I collapsed on the boat. I bleached in horror when reality set in slowly as to what had happened. I saw both of them. Martin's head resting on her belly. Martin had shot her and himself. What had started as nothing more than a New Year's party ended up leading to a tragedy I wince at telling. But for the sake of my own cathartic health, I feel as though I should expand upon what happened as a warning to all of you, my friends. It all happened over New Year's Eve of 2020. After a year ravaged by lockdowns, it was time to unravel with high expectations the year to come and to celebrate the endurance we had shown to get through such harsh conditions the year before. Me and my friends decided to go camping as a celebration. 
It was out of the city, deep into the forest where nobody would catch us breaking any lockdown rules. That, as per me, was the first mistake of many we made that night. This spot over here looks good, I called out, pointing towards a clearing in the middle zone of the forest. I mean, sure, but what about that cave over there? Isn't it a bit weird sleeping near it? My friend John asked with a slightly shaken breath. Nah, don't worry about it. There aren't any dangerous animals that even live in caves in England. Now, let's set up before nighttime approaches so we don't miss our chance to light the fireworks. I was buzzing with excitement. I'd been separated from my friends for months. And this was the first real time we were able to hang out together as a group. Fine. But if anything comes out of there, we would be in a lot of trouble. He motioned towards me and the two others with us, Becca and Tom. Both of whom had already made it to around four beers and were practically crawling around the floor like the animals John so clearly feared. <laughs> the thought made me chuckle. But I hastily got back to prepping the tents and setting up the fireworks before the area became submerged in darkness. Around two hours later, and after many strenuous attempts at setting up the equipment single-handedly, thanks to the three drunkards that had become absolutely wasted in the short space of a couple hours, I was finally able to sit down by the fire. Slightly distancing myself from the smoke that was masking my face in its thick cloud. The fire crackled and snapped as I sat there, mesmerized by it, waiting for just a couple minutes longer before taking a lit stick over to the fireworks I'd set up, ready to launch them up into the sky, and then left in utter awe at their beautiful explosions of color. All was good, until I looked around. I was alone. All my friends had vanished. Now, the fact that I'd taken in at least one to two pints of beer by this point didn't help. It merely caused my brain to clatter about in my skull, causing me to have a blurred vision, still unsure of where my friends had gone. Oi! Oi! Harry! Where of Harry! Come see! The disgruntled voice of John immediately made my spirits rise. I could sense his presence. It almost sounded like he was over by the fire... My head snapped towards the direction of the screaming firework, only to see a bright spark fly off into the trees, followed by a deafening boom, resulting in that same bright flash of colors I had just been excited to watch fizzle out, the sparks catching onto the trees. And in accordance with the explosion itself, there was a sudden shriek emanating from a human voice. Help! I heard Becca's voice screech off in the distance. My blood vessels began to surge with a flood of adrenaline, coursing through my veins with such pressure and energy that I bolted towards her voice, still pleading out for help. I came across her in a matter of moments. Fortunately, the stage of intoxication I was in made it appear to be a stimulant. But as for her and the others, well, they were forced to crawl for the most basic of movements. Jesus Christ, Becca, what the fuck happened? I was enveloped in a seething fury, with the only emotion weighing against it being panic. It, it was John. He, he, he fired off the firework and the, the, Tom was in the way. My mind collapsed in on itself at her foul words. I denied it to myself that they could be so utterly stupid. But then, as I twisted my head around ever so carefully, I witnessed a burnt Tom lying against a tree. His arm was scorched, covered in a black soot from the gunpowder. His legs were trembling with shock, and he appeared to be in a lot of pain. I grabbed Becca by the arms, gave her a shake, and then furiously asked, Where is John? Her eyes swelled up with tears. 
Well, she must have been terrified, but she did manage to blubber out the words right behind you. I dropped her and swiveled my head right round. Only to be met with a horrifically drunken grin smiling back at me. Hey, here comes, here comes, uh, round two! John then sparked a match, held it beneath the firework he held in his hand, facing towards us. And quite literally, in a flash, the rocket whizzed out of his hands whilst he was still cackling, and launched towards us with such a pace that in complete honesty we shouldn't have been able to avoid. But by some miracle, the firework, obviously being aimed poorly, flew past both our heads. And from behind, we heard a seismic wave of noise crash against us, erupting from the small crater left in a tree just meters away, the colors still lighting up the area with a fluorescent glow. From that point onwards, I sprinted towards John, tackling him to the ground and punishing him with a storm of blows, intending to knock him unconscious so he would stop firing off rockets at us. He was very evidently drunk, the first considering he was launching fireworks at his friends, but also in the way he grinned as he set them off, and even now as my fists collided with his face. There seemed something sinister in him, but it was far too difficult to identify what. Eventually, though, my rage got him, and he lay still on the grass, still holding that wretched grin. Becca and I then hauled Tom's body, which was verging on becoming a corpse, back to the car. We then went back for John, whom I dragged against the foliage, only to then chuck him in the back of the boot, far away from anyone he could hurt. After that night, we sent them both to hospital and then waited for the results. John was of course going to be fine as unfortunate as that may be, but we were scared for Tom. Miraculously, after just a couple days in hospital, news came that Tom was recovering well and would be fit soon. All three of us are still good friends. As for John, we haven't spoken since. Now, we wrote it off as an accident, but to me, that vicious grin posed a deeper meaning that nobody else was able to see. Was it really alcohol that caused John's bloodied rampage? Or perhaps something deep within him? Moving into a new town didn't come with a house or a place to stay especially if financial issues stood at the peak of the reason for your movement. I searched for somewhere cheap, and fortunately I found someone looking for a roommate. Or better still, I found a sign close to an apartment expressing a need for a roommate in room 25 of the apartment. In excitement, I went there and met the owner. My intended new roommate was a smile freak. Not those smiles that are welcoming and warm, but the ones that go from one ear to the other. He would randomly look at me and smile so brightly that my heart would almost burst out of its ribcage. Not out of affection, but out of anxiety and maybe fear. He did it when I appeared at his doorstep, but I ignored it. If all he did was smile, it wouldn't cause any harm. A beggar like myself had no choice. I was desperate for a place to stay, and... That was beginning to look like the cheapest I'll ever find. He seemed cool. And after discussing, he agreed to take me in while I paid half of the rent. I swallowed the offer fast and moved in immediately, but something felt off. After moving in, I realized my roommate had some weird hobbies. He liked to keep dead rodents and cut them up for fun. I didn't have many issues with the biological experiments, but I hated how the house stunk due to the behavior. My complaints about his attitude almost became a habit as regular as his. But with time, I got used to his usual response. Whenever I complained, he would give me that creepy smile and say, Better rats than humans, huh? Instead of making a mountain out of a molehill, I simply concluded that he was as weird as the craziness of his experiments. I got used to seeing the rodents, and even got used to the smell. 
Being stranded makes you put up with many things. I soon found a job and started working. Although it wasn't exactly easy, and the pay didn't commensurate with the work I did as a waiter in the sole restaurant in the area. That's well, just like they say, half bread is better than none. The pay was the half bread I wasn't willing to lose. One night, a customer pissed me off and I stepped outside for a bit of fresh air. I stopped in my tracks when I noticed something. There was a dark silhouette staring at me just outside the range of the street lamp blending with the darkness of the night. The image of a person just stood there, unmoving. I narrowed my eyes to check if I was seeing things, but then I realized I was not hallucinating. A weird person stood in the dark staring at me. I didn't know how to react, but I heard myself call out to whoever it was. The person didn't flinch. I could tell because the silhouette remained fixed. I took a step forward. And that was the code. The image took a step back. I took another, and every time I took a step forward, the image would take a step backward. And if I took two, the image took two, too. So I ran. I took to my heels after the silhouette, who, in turn, ran away. Although I lost whoever it was, the person dropped something. A pocket knife. I picked up the knife and went back to my work at the restaurant. Upon getting home, I was with my roommate engrossed in his strange hobby again. I was too shocked from the encounter earlier, I just went straight into the shower. It was when I opened the tap that something hit me in the head. My roommate was using a similar pocket knife to the one I'd seen. It felt blurry and I just knew I had to check. I sped up my time in the shower. Adrenaline rushed through me, and I tried to settle my mind upon what I was investigating, not cowering in fear. I stepped out of the shower, and although I tried to act as normal as possible, I still found my heart racing when I looked at my roommate's hands, which confirmed my fears. I was right. The knives were identical. My heartbeat raced at the idea that my roommate might have been the guy stalking me, with more courage than fear, I gathered words in my mind and practiced my speech in my head before I confronted my roommate and asked why he was stalking me. I told him about the knife I found with the stalker and stared at him in disgust and fear, I may add. However, with that creepy smile on his face, he said one of his knives had been stolen some weeks back. And the person might have been the one, or it was probably just a strange coincidence. The excuse made no sense to me, but what could I do? I made a resolve in my heart to save some money as soon as I could, rent another apartment, and move out. But I knew that wouldn't be happening too soon, so I also made the resolve to stay vigilant. Surprisingly, the same thing happened at work the next day. And the next. And the next. And each time, I was never able to catch the stalker. After a while, I got tired of the rat race and stopped chasing. A few days later, one weekend while at home, I decided to have a movie night by myself, since my roommate had traveled the day before to see his family in another town. As I was enjoying the movie, with only the light from the screen barely lighting up the room, I heard the growling of my stomach and decided to cook dinner. As I stood up, I saw... In the corner, blending with the darkness, the silhouette of a person. I jumped in fright because I could never be sure that I'd lock the door before settling in for the movie. I would have run off, but the person jumped on me and hit me with something hard, knocking me out instantly. I woke up to a person in a strange mask whistling a tune. I was strapped to a table in a very strange room. My mouth was covered with tape. As for the whistling masked man, he walked over to me and took off his mask. I was shocked to see that familiar, creepy smile. I always knew my roommate was crazy, but I never thought it was from the psychopathic angle. Those encounters with that stalker, I had long concluded that it was just a silly prank by my roommate. But this time I was sure it wasn't a prank. As my roommate picked up a pocket knife and started to cut into my stomach, he slowly whispered, Better human than rats, yes! 
crazy thoughts ran through my head. And that's when I thought about it. It was the same with the rodents. They were all operated on while they still had life in them. With the small amount of energy left in me, I grabbed an injection from the side table and launched it into my roommate's body. I didn't know what it was, but he passed out. And after I regained some strength, I ran away. Not just from my crazy roommate, but also from that creepy neighborhood. The worst of nightmares can be forged from the most simple of dreams. One moment you're just a normal girl going on a vacation with her friend, and the next moment you're caught in a murder. My feet brushed against the leaves of the bushes as I made my way through the mountainous terrain. I could hear laughter coming from behind me as we were our way through the trail. Okay, I'm pretty sure that we're lost, I called out as I turned around to face Abby. It was getting dark and the sun was already starting to set. No, I told you we're going on our own turf. I can't stand seeing the Alps with Joey the tour guide anymore, she said with a huff as she came to stand beside me. Abby and I were on a vacation to celebrate our finally finishing college. It was her idea for us to go to the Alps because it was on her bucket list. We had never been there before, but she seemed obsessed with the water springs that were located on the side of the mountain. Our guard had warned us initially against going there because the locals weren't very welcoming towards tourists, but Abby didn't care. She was always very strong-headed like that, and she preferred to do her own thing. Well, as long as you don't get us killed, I muttered under my breath. She didn't bother to respond as we continued making our way down the trail. We had long lost sight of the rest of the group, and although I wondered where they had gone off to, I was more focused on making sure that Abby didn't get us into trouble. It was getting dark, and we hadn't found the springs, and neither had we brought any torchlight with us. I shook my head as I realized that I couldn't do this anymore. I grabbed a hold of Abby's hand as I stopped her in her tracks. We should head back. I can't do this anymore, I said to her. She scoffed, rolling her eyes at me as she made her way deeper into the forest. I groaned, knowing that I had to follow behind her now. Stop it! I hissed, but she didn't listen. Stop worrying about everything. It's gonna be fine, she stated as she backed up against a tree. She didn't get to finish her sentence as a net shot out of the ground and encased her in it. She let out a scream, and I widened my eyes as I made my way over. She began to struggle as she hung several feet off the ground. I I'm gonna get you out, I said as I reached out to tug on the rope. As I pulled on the rope that was attached to the tree, I felt something in case around me. And before I could react, I was also suspended in the air. I let out a loud scream as I found myself encased in the net just like Abby. We were stuck. I tried calling out for help multiple times, but it didn't work as no one seemed to be listening. After several hours, I heard the sound of leaves crunching as a figure in a loincloth and white face paint appeared in front of us. I opened my mouth to scream once more and watched as he pulled out a blow dart shooter and fired one right at my forehead. I felt my heart race as black dots covered my vision, and as he fired the second shot, I passed out. I woke up to the sounds of loud screams coming from all around me. The warmth of the fire was hot against my skin as I had a pounding headache. I groaned loudly as I pulled my eyes open and gasped in shock at the sight around me. I was in a bamboo cage, and I heard a loud chanting coming in front of me. Several men and women danced around the bonfire. I looked around me frantically and took notice of Abby's unconscious body in the corner. I crawled over to her and shook her body slightly. I gasped when I noticed that her neck had been slid open. My eyes watered as I choked back a sob at the realization that she was dead. We must bring one man and woman for the ritual. The man first! I heard a voice call out as I scurried the corner of the cage. I heard loud screaming once more, and then watched the men break off from the bonfire. One of the men had a large bone going through his nose. He turned to look at me with a smirk. I heard shuffling beside my cell, and watched as a man wearing cargo shorts was dragged out of the cell. 
I took notice of a stone slab beside the bonfire and watched frozen in my spot as the man was lifted onto it and tied down onto the slab. He struggled as I watched them pull out a cloth and stuff it into his mouth in order to silence his cries. The man that had stared at me earlier, who I assumed was the chief, made his way over and pulled out a blade. He climbed on top of the captive, and I watched as he slid his wrists open. The blood splattered on the ground as I heard the people chant loudly. There were men banging their drums in the corner as the women cheered in celebration. The chief lifted the blade once more into the air as he stabbed the man in his chest. The man continued to struggle as the chief raised the blade into the air one last time before saying, A SACRIFICE FOR THE GODS! He then slit the man's throat open as he ended his life. I watched with a numb feeling as the body was removed from the altar and thrown into the bonfire. They muttered words in a strange tongue before turning their attention towards me. I pressed my body against the back of the cell, but it was of no use as it was pulled open and two men came inside and dragged me out. All eyes were on me in the dimly lit clearing as I was led toward the slab. I struggled in their hold, screaming frantically as tears streamed down my cheeks. They were much stronger than me as they tied me down onto the slab. They began to hum lowly as someone placed a dirty cloth in my mouth. It tasted like blood. I heard footsteps approaching me as the chief came over to the slab and climbed on top of my abdomen. I stared into his soulless eyes as he lifted up the same bloody dagger and slit my wrists with it. I cried out in pain, but it was muffled by the cloth, and watched as he pulled it out before stabbing my chest, causing my body to lurch. He raised the blade one last time as he said, A sacrifice for the gods. Just as he pressed the blade to my neck, I felt something come over my body as I grabbed a hold of it. I looked up at him with hate-filled eyes before plunging the knife into his neck. I watched as he gurgled and blood splattered on my face. He convulsed for a moment before collapsing on top of me. A sacrifice for the gods, I said hoarsely. I made an attempt to focus on the screen in front of me for the upteenth time, but the noise returned. I eyed the volume of work I had to do. Sheets of paper scattered around my desk and on the panel of the computer, numbers which my concentration could have clarified appeared like puzzles in the most complicated maze. I pressed my fingers together and struggled. Whatever the fuck was wrong with Jim, I cursed under my breath. The noise had gone on for too long, at, at least three weeks since I had observed it. Every evening around 8 p.m. when I had taken a shower and sat in front of my workstation, I would hear a feminine laughter muffled by the border of the walls that divided both our apartments. It did not bother me that he had such ravenous taste for women. I was sure that it was a different woman each time because I had been attentive enough to notice the sounds of their laughter and subsequent conversation. It was difficult to make a distinct meaning of what was being said, but the pitch was traceable. I snatched my keys from my desk and walked to the door in annoyance. I put in my key and turned it. The door opened and immediately I heard a piercing screech, bestial but feminine. The screeching noise echoed with a heavy manly grunt, like one whipping all of his strength. That fucking bastard. I cursed as my male member began to grow between my thighs. I envied his carnal thrill, and I pondered on the usefulness of going to disturb his pleasures. I turned my hands over to check the time. The digital surface of the watch revealed the time to be minutes past 9 p.m. I pushed my door as if to close it. He could have all the fun in the world, I thought to myself. I had work to do. I was about to push the door shut when the screaming returned to fill the air with a surprising urgency. 
It didn't seem to me to be one of pleasure, but some people enjoyed their nighttime throws that way, I assumed. Yet, I thought it was curious. My door clicked as a dozen thoughts raced through my mind. The pressure confused me, and I slowed it all down by inhaling deeply. I thought of Jim and his image appeared in the back of my mind. He was just like any other man I had known. He seemed to know a lot, but I chalked it up to the fact that he was just an attentive person. He had such shiny hair, slicked back and never ruffled whenever I saw him. He had the fullest smile whenever he spoke to me. He was kind and he offered gifts and helped whenever he could. He had been responsible for setting up my light bulbs when they had gone out. He had been gracious enough to help with the fanciful tiny light bulbs that beautified my workshop with a bright glow. He took care of himself, even in his house, and nothing was out of place. Nothing was out of place? How would I even know that? It struck me as deliberate. Something had to be out of place. I never quite paid attention to what he was doing, and if it was in my space, I managed my way through it. We only saw each other a few times, and when we shook hands each, his hands clasped around mine like a vice. Jim. I muttered his name under my breath as I slowly walked back to my workstation. My head spun. I didn't even know my neighbor's surname. I was so busy with work and my own affairs that I had been oblivious to the entire existence. I did not know for what he did for a living or who it was he went out with. I rebuked myself for thinking like an eavesdropping old maid, but I felt unsettled by the noise of his grunting beating through the walls. My eyes went to my workstation, and I wondered what I would have occupied myself with if I did not think too much about Jim. I heard one final grunt, and the blow struck me to my chest, even as my mind raced. I had never seen any of these girls. I spread my fingers and held my hands out in thought when the thought settled. My head was a whirlpool of panic, and I felt warm all over. I was oozing with uncomfortable, clammy sweat immediately. I turned back to the door and hurriedly shoved my key into the keyhole. I turned the lock and pulled it open. I raced to his door and lifted my hands to bang on the surface of his door. The door opened up before I made contact with it. A grimace instinctively came over my panicked face. He stuck his head out of the door gap with a grin on his face, looking nothing like the gym I knew. His hair was tussled as though he had been in a struggle, but he still had his clothes on. I managed to hide my concern by feigning a return to his smile. Hello, Mike, he said, seemingly ready for me. I swallowed. Hey, Jim. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's going swell. He answered with a follow-up giggle that was clearly forced. Uh, good. Great. I know what you're doing, man. I muttered slowly, and he moved up to the door. I watched him carefully cradle the door, squeezing his grip through the pane. Hmm. Interesting. And what do you think that is? He asked. The mood immediately turned darker with tension. Jim did not seem like the neighbor who had such a beautiful smile anymore, and his answers stuck to my throat. His right foot edged forward by the door, and my heart jerked. You're fucking like a stallion, man. Good God. You were about to bring the roof down while I was simply trying to work. I lied awkwardly. His face lit up slowly. Oh, that. Whew, he sighed. Hey, please, can you keep it down? I pleaded, realizing that there was so little that I could do to find my escape. I was certain that he was buying my lie, and I feared my nerves were betraying me in front of him. I tried to imagine what was in his hand behind the door, stealing furtive glances at the impenetrable boundary. I'm sure you'll have no further trouble with noise tonight. 
He smiled fully, and his eyes glazed like one intoxicated. He wasn't buying it. He had the feeling that I knew, and my stomach tightened with nerves. All I had with me was the key to my apartment, and I was staring harm, or possibly death, in the face. Silence lingered, translating our speechlessness to each other. It made me hot to be so desperate. I kicked my foot forward at the door, and his blood-stained baton fell out of his hand. My stomach crumpled on itself, but I managed to lurch forward. I grappled him to the ground and turned the key properly into my grip. Focused, I stabbed down on his throat repeatedly. At that moment, when I watched him struggle for his life, he gagged and blood escaped his mouth. I finally understood his thrill. I sat down on the bed in my hostel room with anxiety. I had just resumed at one of the biggest universities in the state. I had been lucky enough to get into the university, and my family was so proud of me. Most of my family members were high school dropouts. Many parents were an exception to this. Although they had finished high school, but their education ended there. My aunt, the only person I knew who had graduated from the university, left our neighborhood immediately after the graduation ceremony. The last I heard, she was married to a wealthy man and lived in a nice part of the town. Not that being a gold digger was a bad thing. I was just irked that she had never returned to visit her family. I glanced at the bed a few feet from mine. My roommate's bed was neat, freakishly neat. The bed was well made without any creases. I was guessing she would be the nerdy girl. I turned away and began to unpack my meager belongings. I wasn't rich. I grew up in a poor household, but I had parents who wanted the best for my siblings and me. I was almost done with unpacking when the door opened and a girl sauntered in. Was she my roommate? She noticed me at the end of the room and looked surprised, but in a good way. I wasn't expecting you this soon, she said in a silky smooth voice. I'm Charlene, a sophomore. <laughs> I'm Dawn, I responded with a smile. Charlene seemed nice enough, although I hadn't expected her to be anything but white and nerdy, but I guess I was wrong. Later that evening, I was introduced to other girls. They were all nice, a kind that pricked my skin. It was weird. They all seemed like one big family. It wasn't something I was expecting. I expected a tense atmosphere and some rivalry, but these girls called themselves sisters. They all seemed close enough. The dormitory building wasn't a large one. It was a two-story building that housed 30 girls. Two weeks later, Charlene woke me up from sleep. She sat on my bed with a torch on. The lights were off, even the lamp next to me. I was deathly scared. I sat up and feared, but she held my hands. Don't be scared. The head of the house has required me to extend an invitation to you. We are all sisters, and we want you to join us. It's not too difficult. You only need to survive a special night. I did and you may too. Do you accept? I didn't think it would be bad to be among the girls I called my sisters. I envied the closeness between the girls. So in my drowsiness, I nodded my head without asking what the special night was. I should have asked. Charlene smiled at me for accepting the invitation, but it looked forced. I dismissed it as I returned to sleep. The next morning, the whole encounter felt like a dream, until I saw a pink envelope on my desk. I took out the paper from the envelope and read the note. See you by 9 p.m. in the basement. Come wearing all black. Leave your phone behind. It sounded so strange, but curiosity got the better of me. 
So that night, I wore a black sweatshirt with jeans and sneakers and made my way to the basement. The hallway was empty and the rooms oozed with a strange kind of quiet. Fear crept up in my chest as I opened the basement door. It was dark, except for the orange glow which seemed to come from a candle. I walked slowly down the creepy stairs, and the door behind me was suddenly shut. Fright shook me to the core at that moment. Hello? I said. I couldn't hear my voice. Welcome, a voice called out from the darkness and was echoed by other voices. I got to the bottom of the stairs and found three girls sitting around a candle, surrounded by the other girls who stood. I couldn't see anyone's face aside from the other girls around the candle. I was forced to sit with them, my legs in a crisscross position. I tried to say something, but was ordered not to say a word. The other girls and I were forced to repeat an oath, and that was when I knew I was in big trouble. The oath included total loyalty to the house, complete sisterhood, and a lot of secrecy. Everything that happened in the house stayed in the house. Like the initiation process I was about to undergo. We were all told to bend our heads on the ground with the tip of our noses touching the ground. The girl next to me began to cry and she was hit with a stick. Another girl wanted to protest and she was also hit. What sort of sick initiation was this? We were told to maintain that position for what felt like hours. My neck and back hurt. A burning pain crept up my body. I couldn't take it anymore, so I raised my head. A blow came out of the darkness and landed on my back. Many girls began to hit me from all sides. I tried to speak. I tried to beg. But they were only interesting in seeing me bow. I began to gasp for breath as I tried to tell them that I was asthmatic. They didn't listen. I fell back into the previous position and the beating stopped. I still struggled for breath as my nose was touching the ground. I heaved and gasped while the girls laughed and threw insults at me. Tears streamed down my face. Why did I agree to this? When the girls were feeling sleepy, ice cold water hit our skins and we began to shiver. I was pretty sure by that time I was going to die. I fell to the ground this time, shivering and gasping as hands slapped me and legs hit me. Please, <gasps> asthma, <gasps> help. I desperately tried to communicate with them. I couldn't breathe. I held my neck and wheezed. My face felt red. I couldn't make my parents proud. I was going to make them grieve. Soon enough, someone noticed that something was wrong. She's struggling to breathe. The beating stopped, but not the wheezing. Almost like they had rehearsed it, a few girls lifted me off the floor and reassured the others that I would be okay. I was carried up the stairs and out of the dormitory. The cold wind hit me, and I felt hope. I thought they were taking me to a hospital. Instead, they took me towards a bundle of trees behind the dormitory and dropped me onto the grassy ground. Charlene's face came into view. She smiled at me. I guess you aren't going to be our sister. Turns out, you're not worthy enough. Goodbye, Dawn. I struggled to hold her hand, but she let go and kicked me away from her. I rolled into the darkness. When I awoke, I found myself in a shack. Someone was dabbing my head with warm clothes. Sunlight streamed through the bright curtains, lighting up the whole room. I turned to my right to find a middle-aged woman staring at me with concern. She told me how she had found me in a ditch while she was taking a walk around her shack. I was conscious, but I couldn't talk or move. I was taken to the hospital and my parents were contacted. After this incident, I never returned to that place. 
I never went anywhere without my phone and inhaler. My family picked up my belongings, and they heard a silly narrative that I had been kidnapped. I decided to enroll into a nearby college. My name is Scott, and I'm 39 years old. A few months ago, I was invited to spend a weekend with some friends. They rented a cottage around some woods. The idea was to hunt and enjoy some healthy time outside. Unfortunately, as I was halfway there, I realized that my car was almost out of gas. I did find a very small gas station. This was in an area that had practically no signs of civilization. The classic middle of nowhere. It was spring at around 5 p.m., so at least I had a few more hours of daylight. I stopped my car, but there wasn't any gas. <sighs> great. Just great, I said to myself, cursing my bad luck. There was a small building there, obviously an office. Thankfully, someone was inside. A man with long hair and a beard, dressed in working clothes, but very dirty. When he saw me, he came out. Hey, buddy, uh, you need some gas, yeah? He asked. Some of his teeth were missing, but he looked friendly. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, definitely, but it seems like you're out of gas, I replied. <laughs> oh, really? Damn, not many people pass by these roads anymore. <laughs> I run this gas station as a hobby, almost. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm only receiving new fuel next week, he answered. <sighs> You've got to be kidding me. I need to meet some friends. My destination's still like an hour away. Do you have a phone that I can use? My cell phone isn't receiving any signal around here. It's, it's dead. I need to inform my friends to come pick me up, I asked. Mm, sorry, mate. I don't have a phone. However, there is a small town not too far away from here. Just about a 30-minute walk. I can give you directions. Mostly old folks live there. I think some of them have phones, <laughs> the man said. At least one of us was having a good time. Okay, I guess that's my only option, I said. The gas station man told me what trail I should follow. His directions were accurate. I was walking so fast because I was anxious. I got there in about 20 minutes. And boy, oh boy, this town really was small and even more depressing. The only car I saw was an old truck. I saw people looking at me from inside their houses. I knocked on the door of one of the houses. Uh, hello? Uh, hey, excuse me, can I use your uh, phone? It's an emergency. I I'll pay for the phone call, I said. An old woman was looking at me through the window of her house. She was staring at me, her eyes cold and without expression. It was as if she was a statue. It was extremely creepy. I gave up on that particular house and tried another one. But I couldn't believe what I saw, or who I saw. It was the exact same woman. It couldn't be the same, of course, but even the clothes were really similar. Again, I got the same reaction. Just a blank stare, complete indifference from the other side of the window. Ugh, so much for having my pleasant weekend, I said to myself. But my luck was about to change. I saw an old man walking towards me. He was smiling, and at least he looked normal. Good afternoon, stranger. What brings you to our small town which has no name? Are you passing by? He said. Ah, thank goodness. I tried to talk with some of your neighbors, but uh, they weren't as friendly as you. By the way, are those two women from those two houses, are they twin sisters? I asked. Ah, uh, yes, yes they are. Uh, please forgive them. Uh, their mental health is not the best, so to speak. My name is Oscar. The old man introduced himself as we shook hands. Ah, okay, I see. I'm Scott. Nice to meet you. Well, I'm out of gas, and apparently so is the nearby station. I just need to use a phone any phone, so I can call my friends and have them pick me up. 
Absolutely, my young friend. Uh, here, come over to my place. You can use our phone. I live with my wife and Amelia. She'll be happy. We seldom receive visitors around here, Oscar said as I followed him. Since the town was so small, it was less than five minutes till we were there. Oscar's wife, Amelia, was really nice, but her mental health didn't seem the best either. I assumed living in such an isolated place wasn't exactly a good way to keep your brain cells active. I tried to use your phone, but it was mute. Uh, there's no signal, I said, feeling desperate already. Oh my, <laughs> such bad luck. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes that happens, Oscar explained. Uh, okay, um, how much longer before the phone starts to work again, I asked. Hmm, it could be, it uh, could be a few minutes or a lot longer, but never more than a few hours. I can't believe this. Uh, sorry, can I use some other phone? Uh, maybe from like your neighbors, I asked, already guessing the answer. This is the only phone around here. I'm very sorry. You can wait upstairs. We have a nice guest room where you can rest and relax. Amelia will bring you some food and water. Oscar offered. Okay, uh, thank you, I replied. Oscar went upstairs where he showed me the room. At least I could lie down and rest, which, in fact, I did. I was so tired that I fell asleep. I woke up with someone singing. It was nighttime already. What the hell is this? I said before I screamed when I saw who was there. My room was filled with old ladies singing some kind of mantra. All of them were the exact duplicates of each other. They looked precisely like those other twin ladies that I saw earlier in the day. Suddenly, Oscar entered my room. I was still in shock and didn't have time to process. Oscar was carrying a big butcher knife. He was smiling and he said, Scott! You are in luck. You will be sacrificed to our beloved god, Satara. Your soul will be saved. Only the chosen ones reach our town. Realizing I was dealing with some kind of sacrificial cult, I didn't think twice and jumped through the bedroom window, breaking it. Fortunately, it wasn't a big fall, and the grass prevented me from significantly damaging myself. I got up and ran like a maniac, only to see other women coming from their houses walking towards me, singing. They all looked the same, like the others. Fortunately, they weren't running. And finally this time, my luck was really changing for good and for real. As I was walking back to the gas station, I saw another car parked there. It was one of my friends. Scott. There you are. Man, we were worried about you. You didn't arrive when you were supposed to and your cell phone was off. And actually, it might be in this area. Mine isn't capturing signal either. Dude, I'll tell you everything, but please, we gotta get the hell out of here, now. I said as I got into my friend's car, even before he did. My friends found my story unbelievable. The next day, I reported everything to the police. And to my utter disbelief, the authorities said the small town that I reported was completely abandoned. It had been empty for the last 10 years. I have no idea who those people were and how those old ladies were each other's clones. But that talk about the god Satara sometimes still haunts my dreams. I had been at uni for just about a month. It was a struggle leaving home. I miss my family, my friends, even my old teachers. It was the feeling of comfort that drew me home. But the catalyst was that creature I shared the dorm with. During the first week of uni, I was told that rooms were rather sparse and that I would have to share with someone else. I was then given a key and told to alert the school if there were any issues but I should be fine as long as I talked to them so things wouldn't be awkward. 
My room number was 120, and the door was easy to spot because of the scratch marks and dents that covered it. Before even putting the key into the lock, I heard a large bang come from inside and footsteps dashing towards the door, only to see it fling open, revealing my roommate standing at the doorway. He looked skinny, his eyes were darkened from a lack of sleep, and he was breathing heavily, probably because he had just darted over to the door, but a far more morbid reason struck the back of my mind, one that did not need to be brought into reality. Without saying a word, he pointed towards a bed on the other side of the room, which I could only assume was mine. The side that appeared to be his was covered in dents in the walls and even his bed looked like it had been smacked around like some dog toy. Hesitantly, I made my way inside, my roommate still not speaking, but rather dashing around the room in excitement at my arrival, or my naivety. I dumped my bags on the bed and then turned around to ask, uh, Hey man, uh, what's your name? He instantly stopped running around. He froze in place with his back turned to my face as he stared at the wall. Uh, hello? Anyone there? I chuckled nervously, but he remained still, while still keeping his eyes locked on the wall in front of him. No. He spoke. He then started bolting around the room again in excitement, jumping up and down on his bed like some kind of child while a massive grin protruded from his face. That incident alone should have been enough to tell me that I was not safe being in this room. But at the time, I wrote it off as a mishap and unpacked my bags as I set up my side of the room. The next few weeks shared this same ignorance. I would come in at the end of the day and my roommate would fling the door open and then run around the room like some kind of excited dog. But the second I spoke or tried to ask him something, he would freeze with his back facing me, staring at the wall until the moment passed. All along, I truly believed it to be just some kind of nervousness that meant he couldn't cope with social situations, but after a couple weeks, the nights began to change him. One particular evening left me unable to sleep for the rest of the month, my roommate being the cause. It was around 11 p.m., both me and my roommate, who I still didn't know the name of, were in our beds. Me on my phone and my roommate just staring at the ceiling. After about 20 minutes, I fell asleep, only to be awoken by scratching noises on the side of my bed. My eyes snapped open, and for a brief second, I had no clue where I was. The white wall in front of me directed me into reality. I could hear some kind of muffled scratching noise on the other side of my bed and was about to twist around to see what it was until I heard breathing. The breathing was low and heavy. I could feel each breath wash over the back of my neck. It was so close. At first, I was too drowsy to realize what was going on, but after a couple of moments, it hit me that something was looking at me from the side of my bed. Fear completely disabled my ability to move, and I was stuck facing the wall, having to simply endure the breathing and scratching taking place behind me. Then came a sly cackle. At this point, I was fully awake, my blood pumping with adrenaline. I was utterly petrified. Whatever was behind me was directly in the way of the door, too, and no doubt my key was beside this person as well. Getting out clearly wasn't an option, so I was left to either endure it or turn around. I laid there for what felt like hours, my mind in a constant state of turmoil. I had no idea what to do. The breathing never stopped either. It stood so perfectly in place that I began to question whether or not it was real hoping to God it was just a figment of my imagination. And then, a hand suddenly came into my peripherals. Its palms were outstretched and looked ready to grasp me. The nails were long and thin, 
and sharp to the tips. Terror now fully emerged in my body, and fight or flight kicked in. No more fight, I thought. I now turned around, facing towards whatever was waiting there behind me. My roommate's deranged looking eyes glared back at me. What the fuck are you doing? I yelled out, springing myself out of the bed. He leapt back in fright, but swiftly turned to face the other side of the room's wall, standing motionless once again, submerged in the darkness. I jumped out of bed and went to go push him, but the second my hands collided with him, he flung his head around and let out the most powerful screech I had ever heard, with such tremendous volume that I jumped back in shock. His screech had opened his mouth so wide that I was able to see each individual tooth he had in his mouth. They had all been sharpened. I quickly stormed out immediately after that, leaving all my belongings behind. I quickly reported and narrated the whole ordeal with the weird ways that my roommate was to the school, but they simply deemed it as an accident and told me that my roommate was perfectly normal and healthy. Only I knew that the pig suffered some kind of issue known best to him. He was sinister and a complete psycho. I decided to return home and take online classes instead. Nothing was worth returning back to that creepy room. My safety mattered more. Whoever has to share a room with that psycho in the next coming weeks as my replacement, may God help them and keep them safe. I sat at the desk with my head on the table. The classroom buzzed with noise, but I shut it all out with the music that banged into my ears. I wouldn't be in this lousy school in this little town if my parents hadn't died two weeks ago. An arsonist had set fire to the house and I was just lucky to have been in a sleepover. I had to move to my uncle's house after the funeral. It was my first day at a new school and homeroom was as horrible as any grade 11 homeroom could be. I listened to heavy music to avoid conversation. I was lost in the sounds when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I looked up to see a man staring down at me with a grin as wide as SpongeBob's. I took out my earpiece and looked around. Everyone was staring at me. Some chuckled and some smirked. I was probably in some kind of trouble. You must be Jody, the weird man said, and I affirmed his assumption. He introduced himself as Mr. Greg before introducing me to the whole class. I survived homeroom without any unnecessary conversation and attended all my classes. Never mind that my mind was anywhere but the classroom. I had chemistry towards the end of the day, and the teacher was Mr. Greg. He explained chemistry like a child showing off his toys, and kept staring at me on the occasion. Classes were over, and I returned to my homeroom. Mr. Greg addressed all of us when he dismissed us, but he told me to wait behind. It was all silence from there. My classmates quietly walked out of the class as they whispered to themselves. Mr. Gregg took a chair and sat in front of my desk. Um, I heard you lost your parents. He began in a sympathetic tone. Several years ago, uh, I also lost mine. I'm here if you ever need someone to talk to. I only nodded my head in response. I didn't feel like talking to anyone. I expected him to dismiss me, but he sat there weirdly staring at me. I tapped the table nervously, and he seemed to snap out of whatever was on his mind. He rose from his chair and then dismissed me. I hurried out of the class and headed home. I got to my uncle's house, but no one was home. I had been given a key, so I just let myself in. My uncle and my aunt didn't have any kids, so I was alone in this little house. I heard the doorbell ring. I ignored it at first, but the person insisted and rang it again, so I left my room to open the door. A tall brunette was standing at the door with a smile on her face. Hi, 
I'm Sarah, your next door neighbor. Can I come in? Uh, sure, I responded with a cracked voice. I had lost my voice after crying so much the past previous weeks. After talking with Sarah for a minute, it turned out that Sarah was actually in my homeroom, and she remembered my face because she saw me arrive at my uncle's house. She had a warm personality. She told me a lot about the town, but left me with a warning about Mr. Greg. He was a weirdo. The next week we went on a class trip and I wound up getting lost. I, I tried to find my way back, but it felt like I was walking in circles. Sarah called me and said that the bus was about to leave me behind. Mr. Greg found out that I was lost and decided to search for me. He found me staring at a lake of crocodiles and stood next to me. They are beautiful, aren't they? He whispered, and I nodded in agreement, awkwardly. We stood there for a few seconds, and his hands brushed mine. I turned to him with raised eyebrows, and then he held my hands. Let's go meet the others, he smiled. I shook and released my hands from his grasp. He didn't look too happy. He walked ahead and I followed him from a safe distance. We finally made it back to the bus and I was forced to sit next to Mr. Greg. He kept moving uncomfortably close to me and I had to endure that the entire drive. He told me that I had to give him his number when we got back to the school, just in case I got lost again on a trip. From that night, he began to send texts to me about how beautiful I was. He told me I reminded him of his dead mother. He said I had lovely eyes. We began to talk about what it felt like to lose our parents and, well, I began to trust him. Eventually, he began to act creepy. He stared at me during classes and always found ways to be close to me. I was uncomfortable and I was getting scared. I texted him one night and told him how uncomfortable he made me feel. He promised that he would stop. He said that I was the only person he spoke to and, well, honestly, I felt pity for him. I had been in the school for two months and I gradually began to open up to the people around me. I still wasn't my usual self, but I was improving. Mr. Greg and I were still friends. He invited me to a get-together he was hosting for a couple students. He said it was a good opportunity for me to get closer to my classmates. I agreed and told my uncle about it. He was just happy to see me with a social life. I got to Mr. Gregg's house that Saturday evening. It was a dark bungalow in a deserted area. I was feeling uneasy about it, so I texted Sarah the address and told her about the get-together. I pressed the doorbell and Mr. Greg opened the door. He was wearing a gray t-shirt with black pants and greeted me with a smile. He let me in and I looked around. I must have arrived early because no one else was in the house. Where is everyone? I asked and he told me that they were all coming. He offered me a seat and went to his kitchen to retrieve a glass of juice. He sat down next to me when he returned. He moved closer as I took the juice. Our arms touched and the hairs on my body stood up. I slowly moved away and hoped that the other people would arrive soon. You're really pretty, Jody. You know that? Mr. Greg said softly as he moved close to me again. I tried to move my body, but it wouldn't budge. My eyes began to turn and I felt dizzy. Mr. Greg took the glass from my hands before I sipped. He chuckled. My phone kept ringing in the background and he caressed my face and whispered into my ears. I love you, Jody. I love you very much. I tried to protest, but I couldn't. Tears started to stream down my face. What was he going to do to me? He carried me gently and took me down into his basement. The room was filled with pictures of me, many pictures. On my way home from school, at the park, 
in my room. I was extremely scared. He tied me to a chair and brought out a knife. Was I going to meet my parents? Is this how it all ends? The next thing he did shook me to his core. He started cutting into his own chest. I love you, Josie. I love you. Once I have your name on my heart, you too shall have the same. This way we'll be together forever, no matter what. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. He cursed and left me down in the basement. I wish I could have shouted for help, but I was helpless. I heard nothing for a few minutes until boots were heard coming down the stairs. I saw uniforms. It was the police. I was untied and taken to an ambulance where Sarah, my uncle, and his wife were waiting for me with fear in their eyes. Mr. Gregg was arrested. I told them that the get-together was a sham. She told my uncle about it and they tried to call me. When I didn't answer, they informed the police. I should have trusted Mr. Gregg. He was nothing but a creep and a pervert. The idea of cooking never sounded good to me, even as a female living alone. I used to eat from my mom's table before I moved out, and never thought I'd have to fend for myself in school, but that was my reality, and it wasn't going to change anytime soon. Although I had secondary problems, the primary one became what to eat and where to get it. So I often patronized online food vendors, which cost me a lot, but were the only way out of hunger that I knew. Earlier in the morning of my 18th birthday, I had organized a party in my house after school, and my clique of friends had advised me to cook something, contradictory to my plan of just getting alcohol and snacks for the night. Unfortunately, they weren't around to help me cook something, so I was only able to contact Marie, who promised to be there earlier to help cook. Marie had no idea I didn't know the first thing about cooking, so I had it all planned out to cut myself on my thumb before the evening to escape doing any work. I joined her at school as early as possible to discuss how the plan would be, but she was too busy to say much and pleaded that we postpone the conversation till later that day. I spent major hours of the day bothering and scheming on how I wouldn't have to do anything but celebrate my birthday. Moreover, I had a plan B to order from the regular store where I got my food if things didn't work out with Marie. But it was just a plan B, so I didn't put any effort into checking if it would be available. Casey! I heard someone call behind me as I walked down the hallway to the cafeteria. I turned around to see Jessica, an acquaintance I'd made last semester, but had somehow made her way into my contact list and often dropped by at my house. I guess she knew my secret because she never saw me cook and always commended my cooking, which I accepted without any explanation of how bad a cook I was. Jessica. I waved at her as she joined me, and we walked the remaining turns to the cafeteria. Happy birthday! She cheered me on as she opened her arms for a hug, keeping me in her warm embrace, which smelled like donuts and butter. Thank you, Jess. I answered as she opened her arms and held my hand, and we took our first turn towards the cafeteria. I heard there'd be a party at your house tonight, she inquired, and I suddenly remembered I had forgotten to tell Jessica because of her absence from school on the school's political duty with other schools in neighboring cities. Yeah, just friends, but you come over, of course, I urged on. Oh, great. It would have been sad if you didn't invite me, she chided. I'm sorry I didn't tell you earlier. I forgot. And since you're here now, there's no reason to not want you there. We cackled and bumped each other with our shoulders. Have you heard about David's mom's culinary school? She began. And I suddenly remembered the real reason why I never trusted nor felt the vigor to inform her of my birthday party. She loved gossiping and was unrepentant about it. I haven't. You should, since you're a great chef yourself and should be on par with her, Jessica jeered. I've eaten her food and yours, and the difference is clear. Oh, really? I raised a brow, feeling disgusted, but trapped in her enthusiastic voice on how good I was. Of course. And the truth is, it's one of the many reasons I'm so hyped about your birthday. 
Jessica blushed. I can't stop thinking of it. And whenever I try, the sweet savor of whatever you're going to cook threatens my taste bud. That's enough poetry, I cackled, beginning to fear the reality of the situation. There would be food, I affirmed with a shaky voice, hoping she would just quit the food talk and talk about something else. Even football. I'd be more interested in that than cooking. I'm glad to have known you, Cass, as she would often call me. I'd come hungry as well, she finished, and completely cracked me up as we walked into the almost filled up cafeteria. I was doomed to have to eat with her when I suddenly spotted Marie and my other friends sitting around with a space reserved for me. Excuse me, I said, and left her without hearing a reply to join Marie and my other friends. Cassie, they called out as I approached them with my food at hand and joined them at the table. Before I was able to sit down, they began singing a birthday song that suddenly echoed around the cafeteria. At this point, my fear intensified, because the more people knew about my birthday, the more people at my house, which means cooking is now a priority. I went home hurriedly after school to get ready for the party later that night, and when everything was set, I called Marie. But mysteriously, her phone wasn't going through. I kept calling with beads of sweat forming all over my body. I quickly hopped on plan B and called my food fender to deliver 50 packs of different foods in their store. But I realized the world was against me when they hung up on me, claiming they were too busy. I sat depressed and sad. While I scrolled through my phone thinking of who to call next, I came across a food delivery app that I had downloaded months ago. And since it was an apartment and they had a package plan ready for 50 people in their plan, I made an order and it arrived promptly. My secret was saved by this food app, and there was no way I could show enough gratitude as I separated it into dishes, and friends started trooping in for the long-awaited party of the month. An hour into the party, everyone was merry, and the food had been set, so everyone joined in and quickly dug into the food from the serve-yourself tray. It was all going so well, till I suddenly heard about someone slumping in the toilet while defecating. We quickly rushed him out to an ambulance waiting, and returned to the party, though everyone was worried about him. We had barely spent 10 minutes after the ambulance left when people began slumping and fainting without anyone to help. Within 30 minutes, everyone was on the floor looking sick and lifeless, like someone was watching. Before I could call the police, they had arrived and arrested me. I learned from the prison that over 20 people died of food poisoning on that day and many had serious injuries in their lungs and liver. In conclusion, only Jessica, Marie, and I survived the food poisoning, and both of them were at the party, but I didn't see them. What's more, an investigation found that the food app I'd ordered from never existed. <laughs>